the mod was asking how expensive it would cost to build one of these instruments that I'm going to show by. I was just telling them it was about, if you knew what you were doing, you could build one for $100 or $200 maybe at the most. And um, the commercial one is $3,000 to $7,000. So you said, what's the difference? Well, the difference is the, you get a lot more, usually a lot more options with the commercial ones and they may or may not have better electrical specifications, but they usually have been tested so that you know they're guaranteed specifications, whereas what you build, you have to test it yourself and decide if it's working right. And so you put a lot of your own time into it. And if you correctly calculate your own time that you put into it, you might find it's sometimes a bargain to build, buy something rather than build it. Well, it depends on how you value your time. If a grad student spends uh, six months and that's all he does, that's still six thousand dollars. So that's uh, that's not a good bargain. So <laughs> unless you have extra money just to pay him for some salaries and not for some other stuff. And so those are economics that you have to think about. But as a as a learning experience, perhaps it is a, a useful thing. Let's draw our potential stat. I guess I'm going to show. I'm going to use the one in the. Because I don't have the. I want you to follow along with this. And I just had these stapled in the wrong way, so can we zoom in on that? All right. Let's take a look at our, our design and. and uh, Look at our potential stat. Now, potential stat operates in a in a very simple way, and I want to point out this end part here. And this is actually not part of the potential stat proper. It's the part of the circuit that converts the working electrode current to voltage. In fact, the potential stat would work correctly even if there was a, all that we had was a the working electrode was connected to ground directly. Uh, and so the potential stat part of the circuit is over here. Let's just, let's talk about the, this part first to get it out of the way. Here we see the current flowing into this amplifier and you see that right away that that's the current follower amplifier that we talked about. Works exactly the same way. And that's all, our, that's, all that's happening. That point at right there is virtual ground and so the working electrode is effectively held at ground potential all throughout the operation of the instrument. What about the rest of it? Well, remember the auxiliary electrode's job is to supply current and any voltage that we need to drive the reaction at the working electrode. So we're going to use this auxiliary electrode as a current source and a voltage supply. The reference electrode's job in a potential stat is to measure the potential of the solution near the working electrode and to supply a reference point, potential point. So what do we have? Well, we have the reference electrode connected directly to the non-inverting input of our potential stat, of our OA2, which is wired up, as you see, in the voltage follower configuration. So here we have this as a buffer for the uh, potential. So all OA2 is doing for us is buffering the reference electrode, which means that a reference electrode can be, have a high output in impedance, which means that it can be small without having to worry about it. And no current is going to flow out of the reference electrode because the input of OA2 is very high impedance. So OA2 does a very important job for it. It buffers the output of the reference electrode, it keeps the current from flowing in and out of it, and also supplies a low impedance output voltage that's equal to the voltage of the reference electrode. So you can think of the output of OA2 as a, the reference electrode potential and you can get the output here at E sub R as that reference electrode potential. Notice that E sub R and E sub W, which is an external working electrode potential, are applied through um, resistors, R sub W, and OA1 is actually a summing amplifier. Notice it doesn't show a feedback loop like we normally see, but the feedback loop is there. Notice the current flows through the auxiliary electrode and uh, is, there's a circuit in this way. 
So the feedback loop actually includes the solution resistance as part of the feedback loop. And if you do this analysis, you'll see that the, the voltage at the OA1 will be enough to make the, the current that flows at the output equal to the current flows at the working electrode because there's no other place for the current to flow. And that will maintain the potential at the proper point. And that potential is maintained versus the reference electrode because we've used the reference electrode as one of the potentials at the input to the amplifier. So this potential set is in the topology of what they call a summing amplifier. We've added or an addition adder amplifier, just like we talked about before. So we can think of the, the inputs here. Oops. One input will be E sub R, one input will be E sub W, and then this feedback resistor, if you like, is all this other part of the circuit. Okay? And in fact, it's not exactly a resistor. It's going to have some capacitor components in it in, in as well. But the point will be the same. It will be ma maintaining the output uh, here at whatever the reference electrode potential is plus what the working electrode potential is. So in other words, the auxiliary electrode will maintain the working electrode potential at the reference electrode potential plus any extra potential that we've added externally. So if we want the potential to be one volt versus the reference electrode, all we have to do is add one volt at EW to get that potential to be correct. Notice that it is inverted. The reference electrode potential is inverted and the potential output of OA1 is really inverted with respect to what we normally think of as the potential at the working electrode. But that's just because we're having a potential difference between those two points. So this is the negative side of that potential difference and this is the positive side of that potential difference. So we're applying a negative version of that potential here. That's okay because we'll see that as a positive potential difference if, with respect to the other terminal, the working electrode terminal. That can be a little confusing, uh, but you can see how that is if you think about that carefully. So all we've got here is a feedback loop and that's that maintains the desired potential difference between those two points. What happens if we remove the reference electrode from the solution? Now we've broken that loop. We can no longer use that loop to maintain the proper thing and what will happen to our potential stat will get an air light will come on and that air light suggests that the uh, output of OA1 has limited. It has gone to the positive or negative limit, which means the amplifier is no longer to work properly. And that is an indication to you that you've got some error. The reference electrode or the auxiliary electrode is not in solution or the connections are not made. And you can see why that error now occurs because we no longer have the solution resistance included in the feedback loop like we require. Um, this is where sometimes you can run into trouble with potential stats, particularly potential stats that have a very high compliance voltage. Some potential stats can put out hundreds of volts of potential and also can supply large amounts of current. So if you have this disconnected and it's at the limit, there may be 100 volts of potential at the output with the possibility of supplying many milliamps of current along with it. So you get a nasty uh, experience if you manage to make yourself part of that feedback loop by touching it and you don't want to do that. So many high power potential stats can be a little dangerous if you're not careful with what you're doing. Most op amp based circuits, this one for example, would not cause problem because you'd only get about a 10 volt maximum signal at the output and that would not be enough to really give you a shock. Okay. Well, let's think about a bipotential stat. Now, bipotential stats are not used very commonly in most electrochemical experiments, but it turns out that we use them in our lab for our experiment, experiments and also if you're using a rotating ring disk collector, you'd use them as well. The idea here is that we're going to use a bipotential stat to control two working electrodes simultaneously. And in many cases, the, the circuit is essentially identical to before. The current at one working electrode, that one here, 
is amplified here. The current at the second working electrode is amplified here. The only difference is, notice that this working electrode is held at the circuit common potential. So this point here is still virtual ground. The potential at here is not at virtual ground. Notice that it's, we've labeled it here, EW2 minus EW1. The potential at this point is the working electrode potential of potential two that we want subtracted from EW1. So whatever EW1 is, this point is EW2 plus that. Of course, the difference between EW2 and EW1. So if EW1 is at uh, one volt and EW2 is at zero volts, what we'll have is minus one, it would be our common point for that particular uh, amplifier. So rather than being held at virtual ground, it's now being held at a virtual minus one volt for that particular example. And that's tracked. So let's see how that works. This part of the circuit where the reference electrode exists is exactly the same except for that one connection right here, which we'll ignore for the minute. But if you look at here, except for that one connection, that's all the same as before for the other part of the potential that circuit. So that's no different. The job of the auxiliary electrode is still to maintain the working electrode potential of potential of one with respect to the reference electrode to whatever value we desire. And we can add in a separate working electrode potential for one. The difference now is that we're using the reference electrode potential, which we'll call, it's now the negative value of EW1, same EW, ER, the reference electrode potential is minus EW, and vice versa. As I said, the, it just depends on how we, how we think of the potential being measured. But that value gets added in here from that point. So we could have taken it from here, but the way I drew it makes it more convenient to take it right at that point. EW2 is added in here. We start with an initial inverting amplifier with, with a gain of minus one. Notice those two resistors are equal. So there's a minus, so right here is minus EW2. Here is minus EW1. Notice this circuit. This is a diff, diff, uh, a um, differential amplifier at this point, just exactly as we drew, drew, drew previously, with all the resistors equal to each other. So at that point, the output is not scaled in any way. It's just the simple voltage difference between those two points. So this gives us the new common version, the new common we need for uh, the input of working electrode two. So all we're doing is maintaining working electrode two at some offset from EW1 at all times. So no matter what EW1 is doing, we'll be maintaining EW2 at some fixed offset from it, depending on what we put in as EW2. Now EW1 could be a triangle wave, EW2 could be a second triangle wave. Instantaneously, because the circuit can work instantaneously, it will always be maintaining it, whatever the proper potential difference is between those two points. And we don't have to worry about uh, so what we're, essentially we're doing is we're lifting the input here off the ground. Now it doesn't matter that the auxiliary electrode has to supply that additional amount of current. It still does whatever it takes to make sure that the difference between the reference electrode and the auxiliary electrode and the working electrode potential, which is ground potential all the time, is equal to, the, to what we want. All right. Now there's one other thing that we have to think about. There's a differential amplifier here. Notice there's another differential amplifier here. Why do we need another differential amplifier? Well, we don't really need another one to get it to work. But notice that the output of OA4, the op amp 4, is above ground. It's not referenced to circuit common. It's referenced to this voltage level, EW2 minus EW1. So if we hook this up to our recorder, which is reference to ground potential, now we'd have a difference in the two grounds of this value here, and that would cause all kinds of trouble. Um, there's ways to get around that, by the way, but what we can do is just add in a second differential amplifier that subtracts off that extra potential. Notice what we've done here. We've used that EW2 minus EW1 as an input here. 
and the other output here. So that what that does is it takes that output and makes it back to the circuit common potential. So the output here and the output here are both referenced to circuit common and not to the, the internal level that we've got at that point. All right, well, so you, you see it looks very complicated and it is a little bit probably still for you guys, but you can see it's not that difficult to understand. Um, if you think about what we talked about before, all the circuit elements that we talked about are there. The only really tricky part is this feedback loop right here, the, the potential step part. Uh, but that can be understand too, is thinking of that as just simply a resistor between um, the reference and the working electrode. Okay. Well, I was going to say something else here. Oh, well. All right, well, there is one other, the one thing I want to talk about with the uh, potential stat, and that's uh, the fact that the potential stat, as I said, relies on a current feedback amplifier or a current follower amplifier to do the voltage output. And in fact, we don't, sometimes uh, amplifiers don't work that way. And in fact, some amplifiers, some potential stats are very different than I've written here. And almost all of them are way more complicated than I've drawn here because A, they'd have power supplies that are not shown. And B, there are all kinds of input protection devices in case we apply too much current to the amplifier. We don't want it to burn out. Uh, and so on, there's all kinds of extra things in there. There'd be extra circuits for applying the proper potential and to connect it to the computer and so on. So, you know, this is just the heart and very simple idea of it. But in fact, if you made it a uh, potential stat with three op amps, it would work pretty good. You wouldn't have to do much else. So as long as you're satisfied with a, a very limited range of experiments, you could make a very inexpensive device. Let me show you one other thing, though. Let's suppose that instead of as I said, this is limited by the output current capability of OA3. Suppose we have 100 milliamps coming in here, and OA3 really only can supply 10 milliamps. Well, in that case, we have no measurement of current at all. We're, we're, it's not going to work. So when you have large current amounts, it's sometimes easier to do the current measurement in a different way. Let's just take the working electrode, and instead of connecting it directly to ground, let's take, connect it to ground across a, a, a resistor we'll call R sub M, and we'll call that R sub M a measurement resistor, and we'll take a differential amplifier and that differential amplifier would be just like the ones we showed previously, but we can initially just draw it as a simple op amp. And all we have to do is take the difference between those two points and amplify it out because the current flowing to ground here is going to be develop a voltage across that measurement resistance. So V out is going to be equal to I in times R in. So let's suppose we have 100 milliamps. Well, if we have one ohm RM value there, what kind of voltage would we develop? We develop um, um, a tenth of a volt across those terminals, which you can easily measure. Um, now, the problem is, notice the problem. That means that the working electric potential isn't at ground, it's actually at ground plus 0.1 volt because we've developed the potential across that resistor. In fact, this is exactly how the Solartron does the experiment. So for, um, for um, your benefit there. So what you have to do is choose RM carefully so that it doesn't interfere too much with your signal. What you want to do is make RM small enough so that you don't really get large amounts of voltage drop developing across that resistor. You might want to use a value of, say, a tenth of an ohm in that case. So now that the voltage is maybe 10, volt, 10 millivolts instead of a, a tenth of a volt. But when you have really large current values, you want to use very small RM values. As the currents become smaller and smaller, then RMs can increase to 100 ohms or more. At that point, it really doesn't matter because you're still not developing enough voltage to cause any error on the, on the voltage you've measured here. 
but this is definitely more useful for large currents uh, than the feedback method that we show here. Okay. One other thing about potential stats before we finish them up, and I'm going to go off your notes for a second. I didn't have, I did this just before we came in because I forgot to put